Thank you, George. As it happens, I first started working at the National Interest in 1989 in the summer when we published Fran Francis Fukuyama's The End of History. And I take, I don't know if it was serendipity or not, um, I've never taken credit for it, but the magazine, I think, reflects in some ways the original view of both Owen Harry's and Irving Kristol. It is a realist magazine, but no one has done more to ensure the vitality and vigor of the magazine than the founding president and CEO of the Center for the National Interest, Dimitri Symes. It's my pleasure to introduce Dimitri tonight whose su support and vision have been indispensable both for the center and for the magazine. In the past year and a half or so, we've encountered some turbulent waters. We are in smoother ones now, but I believe that Dimitri has shown vision and prudence, a realist hallmark, ensuring that the ship of the Center for the National Interest has come safely into port. And the magazine and the center both continue to build upon and expand the original vision that was present in the founding when it was founded under President Richard Nixon. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dimitri. Jacob, thank you very much. I have to say that working with people like Jacob, it is very easy uh, to exercise steady le leadership. Uh, when uh, we were facing what uh, Jacob called turbulent waters, uh, I talked to Jacob about how we could find a reliable path forward. And Jacob said to me, give me more money. <laughs> and they said, Jacob! We don't quite have money. We're paying uh, the lawyers. Uh, we're in a kind of a very uncharted territory. So Jacob said then, you certainly have to give me money. And that's what we did. Uh, we uh, decided that in the situation which we faced, the most reliable path forward was an old traditional American path, capitalism. And we decided to turn the national interest into a free market enterprise. We spent money on the website, dramatically changed it. We spent money on hardware, on software. Jacob brought uh, new authors. He has a very able deputy, Harry Kazianis, uh, who uh, uh, really owns great credit for our success. I did not allow him to come here because I knew that if he would come here, half of you would want to hide him away from us. Uh, but the story is that by the end of the year we have doubled our budget. Uh, which is not to say that we do not want to engage in fundraising, which most definitely does not mean that we are not terribly grateful to our supporters. And you know, we don't also have an excessive sense of independence, because true independence in our world is usually, how to put it, relative and temporary. But nonetheless, Jacob, he is the one uh, who allowed us not just uh, uh, to survive, not just to move forward, but really for the first time to have resources which allow us a lot of things which we would want to do, including adding more senior programs on China, uh, on uh, Russia, uh, on uh, and artificial intelligence, uh, programs which would allow us to expand our reach. Let me also say that the Center is a rather unusual organization in terms of how we measure our success. Uh, the Center was visualized by uh, Richard Nixon who during the last years of his life have decided that uh, despite his uh, long-term, uh, how to put it, skepticism about think tanks, uh, that he wanted to have a small 
think tank built around him. And uh, he consulted a number of people, most important Dr. Kissinger. I remember how I had a meeting with Nixon uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, told to go and see Dr. Kissinger in his office. And uh, I was also instructed to come back and to report what Dr. Kissinger said. I'm sure that they had a conversation of their own, but basically Dr. Kissinger's view was uh, quite instrumental in Nixon's decision to proceed with uh, this new organization. One thing he told me about what kind of center he wanted uh, was that he wanted an organization that would be a little different. Uh, his question was, why did he have to create a new center at this fairly advanced age as he considered at that time? He was slightly older than I am now. Uh, he also was asking why Washington needs another think tank. And basically he said that if he would become involved in something like that, and he expected to be involved, uh, uh, he uh, basically wanted to see an organization which would be different, which would be able to, to deal with difficult issues, and which would not try to seek mainstream recognition and artificial popularity. That is one reason that when we look at our role in Washington, we do not measure by uh, a kind of uh, universal applause or recognition uh, in terms of uh, every organization and every point of view feeling that we should be respected. We do know what we want to accomplish, and we want to be a genuine non-partisan organization uh, devoted to foreign policy realism, and as our chairman, General Boyd, likes to put it, strategic realism. Realism which uh, is not a kind of pedestrian pragmatism, but which is rooted in long-term American interests. Uh, Henry Truman uh, is uh, reported to say that if you want to hand a friend in Washington, you need to get a dog. I am a great admirer of uh, President Truman, but I have to tell you that as we were moving through turbulent time, we discovered that we had a lot of friends in Washington. And we particularly discovered that we could rely on our board. We have a number of board members in this room. Some of them are on the program, some are not. But we are tremendously grateful to all of them for their support and for their understanding of our position. And we are particularly grateful to General Boyd. Uh, I don't know how to describe General Boyd. When I was uh, still in the Soviet Union, I had an opportunity to meet some pretty distinguished military officers. And these were people of great physical courage, and I would not be afraid to say of great military talent. There was one thing they did not have, civic courage, a sense of political and personal integrity. And one reason this center, I believe, was and remains a successful story is a steady leadership and inspiration of General Boyd. And we, of course, again are very grateful to our board and to people on our board who don't just provide financial support, as one of our leaders, our vice chairman, Drew Gaff, who is chairman of this event, but also who provide us with intellectual inspiration. But more about that, Jacob Halbrand. Well, one of the nice things about tonight is that you'll get to meet, in a, in a certain sense, a number of people affiliated with the center. And I am delighted to be able to introduce Graham Allison, who has been a stalwart supporter of both the center and the magazine. Graham has had a stellar career at Harvard, where he ran the Belfer Center for many years. He's now the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government there. He is, was a, an Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton Administration, and he's a member of the board of the Center for the National Interest and a stalwart contributor to the magazine as well. And if you look at the cover, you'll see that Graham has co-authored a piece on artificial intelligence. And I would say that there is nothing artificial about Graham's intelligence. Please join me in welcoming him tonight.
Thank, thank you very much. The, the host asks if from a, uh, from a distance, I would try to say a few words about uh, what the center has accomplished over these 25 years. So uh, 25 years in five minutes, not likely, but let me say a few things. Uh, a 25-year record in which an organization holds true to its mission in the craziness of a town called Washington is a wonder, a genuine wonder. And I applaud uh, what the, uh, the, the core staff uh, under Dimitri's leadership have done in creating a center and a magazine and a, 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 an, a, a, an epicenter, indeed, of serious debate about serious national security issues that we can all be proud of. I'm going to underline just three points. First, the center is about grounded realism. So not the realism of a neo-isolationist or neo-con, but realism grounded in American national interests. So it's not by accident that the magazine is called the National Interest. It's not by accident that it's called the Center for the National Interest. Secondly, a serious strategic perspective that insists on alignments of means and ends. And thirdly, unblinking nonpartisanship, especially when the winds are blowing the harshest. So before I say a word about each, I just ask you to think back 25 years. So that's 1994. Americans were still consumed by the unipolar moment, still celebrating the end of the Cold War. Clinton was president. The banner for national security was called Engage and Enlarge in which we were going to engage and enlarge and ultimately create a, a world of market-based democracies. The thesis of the area, of the, of the era, uh, Jacob has already mentioned, Frank Fukuyama's End of History. And you can hardly say these words now without smiling, but this book, which was the most important book of the decade, celebrated the end of history. The ideological conflict that had gone on for all of history was over. Market-based democracies like the US had won. And if that were not enough, the leading, edi the leading uh, editorialist of the period, Tom Friedman, wrote a book called The World is Flat, a best-selling book over the decade. And what did it declare? Now peace would be perpetual. Because, as he explains in the Golden Arches Theory of Peace, I'm just telling you from the book, two countries that have McDonald's Golden Arches cannot fight each other because citizens will want hamburgers more than they'll want to fight. So into that environment steps the Center for the National Interest. Thank goodness. For Dimitri, for Richard Nixon, for the wise members of Richard Dixon's uh, cabinet, Henry Kissinger, Jim Schlesinger, for Hank Greenberg, who stepped up early. This group of people created the epicenter for realism, for strategic thinking, and on a nonpartisan basis here in Washington over this period. So realism basically uh, uh, is gra realism grounded in national interests. Starts with the world as it is, not to, as we want it to be. Is realistic about the power of nations, about war, about risks of war, and about attempting to advance national interest on the basis of a realistic assessment of the environment that it has to face and what has to be dealt with. Serious strategy has to be sustainable a sustainable alignment of means and ends for long enough to achieve the objectives. And in the same way that Henry Kissinger and Richard Dixon had an idea what they were doing about Russia, the Soviet Union, they had an idea what they were doing about China, they started with a strategic conception of things. That's a very 
in Washington uh, form of, of thinking, but the center is held fast to that. And finally, the nonpartisan uh, uh, basis. Uh, the center is a place where everything can be debated vigorously in a civil manner. Uh, and you don't really have a sense for who are Democrats and who are Republicans and who are independents. These are Americans trying to understand from the perspective of American national interest, what, what is the, the threat from a rising China? What is the risk from a resurgent Russia? Should we be fighting this war or that war, or in what form? All those issues to be debated, not in partisan terms, but in terms of what's in the interests of the US. So I, I would just say, for, uh, from the perspective of somebody who's watched over this period from Harvard, the emergence of an epicenter in Washington of serious thinking that's realistic, strategic, and nonpartisan, this has made a great contribution to the country. I would uh, give a shout out for Dimitri, for the board, uh, Henry and Jim Schlesinger and uh, so many others, including Hank, uh, who have over this period managed in each year and in each five years and in each decade to bring on a team like the team that's represented by Jacob and the National Interest Magazine, and now produce not just a center where you've got vigorous debate about everything, but a magazine that's become the major uh, locus for serious debate about all these issues. So I just say, please, let's raise our, ga our glasses for a Kuzo for the Center for the National Interest, Dimitri, and a fantastic team. Graham, tell me what you really think. Please enjoy the main dish and we will resume in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>